Tonight, we're going to be focusing on networks and on one particular family that connects our two park stories together. If you've joined us in the past, we've talked a bit about the different business connections between different park nodes within the Blackstone Valley. And we really have a special connection to the Saugus Ironworks pictured here. If you've been to different parts of the valley, you might also recognize aspects of this photo. The exterior water wheel, simple wooden buildings, and a beautiful historic setting. On our journey tonight, we're going to be focusing on some of the people who transformed the landscape around what's now called the Blackstone River in the place that we call Pawtucket. Often in Rhode Island, it's a bit of a joke that we like to talk about things as a reference of what used to be there. That is not good practice as a park ranger. You're supposed to talk about what people are experiencing with you as you journey through a community or a national park. In Pawtucket, we have a lot of traces of industry from the late 17 and 1800s. What we don't have is a lot of traces of the foundation of that industry, which go back to the 1600s. It's also the story that ties us to the Saugus Ironworks. You'll see in places like downtown on brick buildings, signs that say things like, near this spot, something happened. In this particular case, just off of the main street in Pawtucket, there is a sign that reads, near this spot. Joseph Jenks, founder of Pawtucket, built his first house, also created a settlement. So who was this Joseph Jenks and what's his connection to the Saugus Ironworks? To get us started, I want us to first think about some of the networks that you might have in your life. We use the word social network quite a bit, and I think through Parked at Home, we've also all become a bit of a network through the past few years. Networking to you might look like going out to a social event, it might mean logging on to LinkedIn, or it might just mean exchanging business cards at a conference. Networking, of course, was very different in the 16, 17, and 1800s. And part of how we try to retrace networks is through different aspects. We might be looking at common traits, common marks, ways that people did their job. But the networks that are really obvious to us today can be very hard to reconstruct. This is where the Jenks family comes in, and we have a few different interesting network stories that tie this all together. When I started doing research for this presentation, Andrew and I knew that it made perfect sense to talk about the Jenks family because the first Joseph Jenks that comes to this continent goes to the place called Saugus. And his son, this Joseph Jenks, in 1671, comes down to the banks of the Blackstone River and creates Pawtucket. It's a pretty easy story. What was fascinating was learning that for decades, genealogists had a really hard time reconstructing Joseph I's family network. Who was this Joseph Jenks who goes to Saugus, leaving England right during the middle of a civil war? Well, part of why they had a hard time tracking him down is there were multiple Joseph Jenks who actually fit the bill quite well. So how are they going to find the Joseph Jenks who ends up running the sawmill and creating the ironworks at Saugus? Turns out it's as simple as a mark of a thistle. They finally discover that there was a Joseph Jenks born in the Blackfriars part of London in the turn of the 1599 to 1600s. So they figure out this is the person that they are looking for. And part of how they figure this out is there was a man named John Jenks living in that area who did the mark of a thistle in his work. And we see this carried on through Joseph. They also determine that this is the Joseph who would go on to work in Saugus because he ends up spending time working in a particular shop, learning how to make swords and other kind of what they call cutlery. Benjamin Stone, who trains the first Joseph Jenks on how to make swords, applied for a patent in 1635. This is when the man working for him, Joseph Jenks, is really starting to come into his own. 
Benjamin Stone is going to teach Joseph Jenks something very important, just how to secure a privilege or a royal prerogative for your work. In turn, the first Joseph Jenks, when he arrives in Massachusetts Bay, is going to apply for the first patent in that colony. That's another pretty good clue. We're also going to learn more about what Joseph Jenks actually did through the people who worked with him, who proudly said that they had been trained by Joseph Jenks, so we learn even more about what he's teaching people how to do through his operation. There's other connections as well. A genealogist tells us that the stone patent was among the few granted then in England. This is in the 1630s. The Jenks patent was the first patent granted in America. Both were for labor-saving devices involving the finishing of sharp iron instruments by use of water wheels. Joseph had apparently learned the secrets of cutlers as developed by stone and applied that knowledge in America. Like later people in industry, Joseph is going to take a set of skills that he learns in a small village in England and transplant these things to a new place, very foreign to him. And this is from a great genealogy packet, which gives you an up-close view of the place. I love the label, the cut and the sword mill, where Joseph is learning this particular trade. But Joseph and his son, unhelpfully for us, also named Joseph, are going to learn that in this new place, some of the old problems are following them there. When we find out that Joseph I leaves because the person he's training with, Benjamin Stone, has to put his business to a stop by order of Oliver Cromwell, you might be imagining that the 1642 departure of Joseph I, it's not coincidental. It's very deliberate. He's coming to this new place to set up his works to start a new life, hoping that some of those skills will still transfer. About five years later, his son Joseph joins him and comes to the place we now call Lynn. If this son was hoping to get away from the challenges of being in a country in the midst of a civil war, or perhaps hoping to find a more tolerant place to live, he is going to be disappointed by Massachusetts. It's not a commentary on Massachusetts today, just a fact about the 17th century. When Joseph II arrives in 1647, he eventually settles and marries a woman named Esther. And Esther is going to have her own share of problems as a fellow emigre from England to this new colony. She is going to get in trouble for something probably unfathomable to us today, and that's wearing silver lace. As far as I know, that's allowed at both of our national parks. Susan Boucher, who is a Pawtucket historian, says, this was a love of fashion which neither law nor religion could extinguish. But that's not really what it's about. Someone who is wearing something outside of what they're supposed to in the colonies is declaring something about themselves. The reason why we have people applying for patents or privileges or constantly asking for permission, essentially, back in England from the crown or from their ruler is this is a colony and colonies exist with very specific sets of rules and biases and laws. We find out that Esther's crime will pale in comparison to Joseph II's crime, which is treason. He is charged with treason after a political dispute and someone in the community comes forward to say or depose that he did hear Joseph Jenks Jr. say that if he had the kings here, he would cut off his head and make a football of it. That kind of talk was not encouraged or allowed. Now we understand why Joseph Jenks is going to leave his father's already very successful enterprise in Saugus and go down to a place ruled a bit differently. He's going to leave to go to the colony and to where Roger Williams has set up what he calls a lively experiment. Roger Williams had created Providence not long before Joseph Jenks Sr. traveled from England to the colonies, just about six years earlier. 
already it had a reputation and it was a bit of a magnet for people who were looking to leave or being asked to leave Massachusetts as Roger Williams had been. It was a place for people distressed of conscience. The second Joseph Jenks comes to Pawtucket and creates the foundation for manufacturing for all of what's to come later. He sets up on 60 acres on the west side of the falls and builds a house around 1671. Again, there's no trace of that today, but he would be on the west side of this beautiful natural set of falls. Four years after his arrival is the outbreak of King Philip's War, which was an absolutely catastrophic event by any measure for anyone residing in this area. It's also going to be a turning point for certain colonial settlements. Jenks could have been among the many who retreat and don't come back to small fledgling operations, but Jenks is somehow able to rebuild and rebuild he does. After he comes back and gets a sawmill and other small milling operations and a forge going, there is going to be rings of development that effectively emanate out from this west side of the falls of the Blackstone River. And those rings are going to develop into a community and a set of networks. In the 1700s, that ring of the town is going to be alluring to people who want to take the tools and parts and things that are made by these early colonial blacksmiths. And they're going to want to build something totally different for a new country called the United States. And that is going to serve as a magnet for another young immigrant this time it will be Samuel Slater. The rest is a bit of history at Slater's Mill. Of course, all of early American industry was not started by one family, not just by one father and by one son. So Andrew is going to take us much deeper beyond just kind of this Jenks network and give us a sense of what's actually happening in a forge. How are people actually building tools and how do they leave their mark? So I'll go ahead and transfer, I'll stop my screen share here um, and transfer over to Andrew. Great, Allison, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank let you. me just start with the screen share. So glad to be joining everyone tonight. I love seeing in the chat, the variety of people from all over the country. I was expecting a little more of a local crowd and I love to be, see, you know, the network that your whole team has built here, so. It's really exciting. Allison, can you see that? Wonderful, thank you. Um, so as Allison said, my name's Andrew Donovan. I'm the Supervisory Park Ranger at uh, Saugus Ironworks and Salem Maritime National Historic Sites, both located in Essex County, just north of Boston. And Saugus Ironworks, uh, I find is a really special site to think about industry and network and community you know, community in so many different ways. As I said, we are right north of Boston. On the left-hand side, we've got a sort of illustration of a site. And one thing that I wanna sort of lay out at the beginning is if you were to visit Saugus Ironworks, which I encourage everyone to come do, um, most of the site is actually a reconstruction. You know, Allison was just speaking about what's there, what's not there. We're in an interesting middle ground, you know? Most of the buildings I'll be talking about today, the blast furnace, the forge, the rolling and slitting mill, these are reconstructions on the original sites of those buildings based on archaeological evidence. So this ar uh, archaeological work that was done is going to inform a lot of the story. I have some examples sort of in our slideshow here, um, but it's that sort of unique balance. So as you see these buildings, they look great because they're not, you know, almost 400 years old. They're younger than that. Um, so each park has a park purpose and ours focuses in on this ironworks that historically was called Hammersmith and ran from the mid 1640s till about 1670. As Allison said, we'll talk a little bit about kind of how this is gonna get started and really what's it like to be an iron worker in in a colony that has its challenges. But one thing that's really important to recognize is this site that we think of as Saugus nowadays, 
has been a site of industry and creation for many, many years, you know, 10,000 years plus. Um, so indigenous people along the banks of the Saugus River would have been creating tools, especially from a uh, stone called Saugus rhyolite. And thinking about connections, you know, those don't start with the colonists. This Saugus rhyolite that's very specific to this area in Essex County has been found as far away as Pennsylvania from trade networks and things like that. So indigenous people living on this land, um, you know, are creating these tools, are using this river in an industrial way, similarly to the ironworks. Um, and the reason I like to bring this up too is a lot of this, a lot of these resources were found during the archaeological dig. There was ironworks resources found, but an incredible amount of stone tools um, were found during this archaeological dig. And I encourage everyone to come visit our museum to see some of both the indigenous tools as well as archaeological pieces like the um, water wheel remnant you see right there. I have a few plugs like this throughout the program where I try to, you know, convince you to come see the park. So as Allison said, we are in an early colony, right? 1630 Massachusetts Bay Colony is going to be established and it's going to be based on really religious law. There's going to be an allowance for Massachusetts Bay Colony to have a bit more flexibility than other colonies and sort of set its own rules and guidelines. While there's independence in terms of sort of religious thought from mainland England, there's still a lot of dependence in the colony on specialized goods. So a lot of these first early colonists that are coming over, you know, they're making their life farming, um, but skilled and heavier industry, things like iron, glass working, specialized tools, that's not available in Massachusetts Bay, and it's not available in any other colony locally. If you want something of that nature, you're looking to England to bring it over. There's stories of Boston ships, you know, the most precious things coming over are things like cloth and iron goods from England. So the governor looks and decides his son is the best person to create a new ironworks here in the colony. Uh, it's a little concerning. His son doesn't have experience creating an ironwork, so he tries. It doesn't go over too well. For any of our local audience, uh, they set up a blast furnace uh, in the Braintree, Quincy area. If you're uh, local and you hear uh, on the news that there's a backup on the Furnacebrook Parkway, that's where they're talking about. So they have these investors, both in Boston and in England, they want to build an ironworks. They see a lot of potential to make money and to help create a little bit more independence for this colony. So this is going to start the ball rolling to have a conversation. So who needs to be involved? Okay, we've tried the governor's son. He didn't do a great job. This is a specialized skill that we do not have here. This is when you're going to start to see the recruitment that's going to lead to people like the Jenks family and others coming over. But it's gonna be a non-Puritan named Richard Leader who has experience in English ironworking that's actually going to be paid very handsomely to come to this colony and to create this ironworks. So I'm sure at, you know, down in uh, Pawtucket and everything, we know a similar story, but when you're looking to build your new industrial hub, well, it's all about location, right? You need water power to run this heavy machinery. You need access most of this time back then by boat to bring in raw materials, to bring out semi-finished or finished products. And you need those raw materials. And the three we're really going to look at today are iron ore, gabbro, which is another type of uh, kind of mineral. We call it a flux that helps clean the iron and charcoal to keep these fires burning. Just a little bit of sort of uh, location here. Our yellow star is where the ironworks is on the Saugus River. And originally, nowadays we call it Saugus Ironworks. Originally it was called Hammersmith. 
So this new ironworks of Hammersmith is going to be funded by investors, like I said, both in the colony as well as sympathetic investors over in England. And as they start deciding on the location, they're creating a huge 600 acre complex. Nowadays, the park's nine and a half acres. But back then, you have, you need space for farming to feed the workers. You need worker housing. You need a huge holding pond of water to make sure these water wheels are running smoothly. So that's where you get this much, much larger um, sort of acreage to run the whole system. And in building this new ironworks, they're going to focus in on a few main buildings. We'll go kind of bit by bit in the iron making process to see how it all works together and how the human sort of story and the human experience uh, ties in. So to start off, you start at the blast furnace. The blast furnace really has two different parts. You've got the top, you've got the bottom working together. Um, so this stone furnace is gonna be used to melt those raw materials and to take the iron and remove it from the sort of iron ore that also has other minerals in it. So workers are gonna feed these different raw materials in from the very top, just like in the illustration. And it's gonna be layered, a layer of charcoal, a layer of iron ore, a layer of gabbro, a layer of charcoal, iron ore, gabbro, sort of like a big parfait. They're gonna keep layering it to keep that iron moving and melting. At the bottom, air is being pumped in with these big bellows, these wooden and leather bellows are running to keep that fire hot, usually up to 3000 degrees Fahrenheit to melt that rock. All of this is being overseen by a skilled worker that knows how to balance everything, right? How hot does it need to be to get the type of iron that you want to pour at the bottom? How soon should you be filling up the iron on the top? So this leader is going to be sort of barking up orders to the top, telling them to put in the next bushel of coal to make sure it all runs smoothly. And with an organization like this, once you get this furnace going, you do not want it to stop. So this is not something that you start and stop easily. This, a furnace like this would probably run between 30 and 40 weeks straight, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You have people doing shifts, making sure it's all working smoothly. And remember, this is at a time when so many people are, you know, making their uh, living, farming, coopering, you know, doing this type of work that, a heavy industry, a 24-7 industry like this is going to be so different. The skilled workers, those work leaders are also going to be English workers with experience in ironworking. You can't just kind of pick anyone to do this job. You need someone who has the practice. The only place to get the practice is for most of them over in England. So what's going into this furnace, right? You have the what we call bog ore, obviously called that. It settles in bogs and is found at the bottom. And it's a rock with iron in it, but it's not just pure iron. You know, it's got all sorts of other minerals and components that have to be removed while it gets melted. To get all these raw materials, the ironwork um, sort of leaders are relying on a larger network too. They're paying um, farmers who are maybe draining down little marshes because they wanna use it as farmland and they see this sort of rusty colored rock. They realize it has bog, it has iron in it. So they sell it to the ironworks. They're creating these networks to keep this raw material coming in. So, so Gabbro, if anyone's thought of or heard of maybe uh, iron working over in England, you often hear limestone being used to help purify the iron. This is serving the same purpose. It's used as what we call a flux to help remove the other impurities and to draw those out. So as that is being pulled in, it's being mined right at the end of the Saugus River and floated up river on sort of shallow boats like you see right there. Finally, charcoal. Charcoal is an incredibly intense labor uh, of love really to sort of make this material. So you'd have woodcutters clearing land and creating these huge 
uh, mounds to make that charcoal. Once again, skilled colliers that make the charcoal are going to be watching 10 to 14 days for that slow burn so wood transforms into charcoal. And an important thing that we like to point out too as we talk about networks um, is we do have records of at least two indigenous people being paid by the ironworks for wood cutting. So it's very important to remember that there's communication, there are still connections here. Obviously it is not being used the same way, but indigenous people are still part of the community uh, back then as they are today, obviously. So all that work, the filling of the raw materials up top is leading towards the bottom of the furnace. So this is called the casting shed. So the liquid iron is starting to collect at the bottom. And about once or twice a day, they're actually going to pierce a clay plug that's holding the iron back and let it flow out into the sand at the base of the, at the, base of the furnace. As it comes out, you're going to have sort of two levels, the slag, that waste from the iron, the sort of all those other minerals that have been removed is going to be floating on top and scooped off. And the molten iron is going to be flowing into bars like you can see in that illustration right there. Sometimes you'd also want something that has a very particular shape, right? You can imagine things like pots for your home or big salt pans for drying out uh, salt. So that would be cast iron. Many of us, when we think of cast iron, we think of cooking. Same sort of idea, right? They're going to ladle out some iron and fill clay molds like that small front sort of illustration to make cast iron pots, kettles, fire backs, which are used to protect bricks and radiate some heat back in these early colonial houses. So lots and lots of incredible work happening at the base of the furnace to make sure everything runs smoothly. You can see in the bottom corner there too, another artifact from the industrial site um, that is a broken piece of a cast iron uh, pot there. These cast iron pieces are gonna be some of the products that are being made at the ironworks. You can imagine they're gonna be dug up, taken out of their molds, they're going to be sanded. Those will be basically ready to be sold, right? Um, other iron, though, you want to rework it and reshape it. So that's when you move on. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. But we're going to move on in a second to the uh, forge. But it's good to remember, too, how this archaeological work is being done, right? So in the at the ironworks, all this slag, this waste material is being produced by the furnace. They don't have a use for it. They can't come up with a good way to use this kind of byproduct. So what do you do with it? Oh, you toss it in the river over and over again, 1640 to 1670, wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow of this slag waste is being dumped in the river. And it's creating what kind of looks like a natural ridge there. You know, nowadays grass has grown over it. it. It's kind of unassuming. When Roland Robinson will talk about the, archeo um, the archeologist who's doing excavations on this site comes to Saugus in the late 1940s. There isn't clear signs of where the ironworks used to be. They know it was generally in this area but you don't see the water wheels. You don't have the bases and the foundations of the buildings. But what he does know, it's pointed out to him, is this slag pile, this sort of pile of industrial waste. He looks at it and he draws a line back towards the land and he decides to start basically poking around, literally poking with a big metal stick to see if he can find the base of the furnace knowing and knowing correctly that they're not going to move this far. So they are just rolling it right out from the base of the furnace and dumping it in the river. And that's how within the first few days, he's able to find the foundation of the original blast furnace. So, so like I said, I got a little ahead of myself with our forging, but a lot of the iron that's being made at the furnace is then going to be brought to what's called the forge to be reworked. So they want to take um, bars of cast iron 
that is usually about 250 to 300 pounds, they want to rework it. They want to make it so it's structurally stronger, so it could be used for things that are more maybe high impact, right? Wrought iron for nails, for saw blades, for, um, you know, bands for wagon wheels. Cast iron, we think about, okay, it's great for cooking, but you do not want to drop that on a, uh, you know, on a tile floor. Wrought iron is going to be that sort of heavier, more pliable iron for other industrial work. So they're going to take these big uh, bars of pig iron and they're going to melt them down. Then they're going to start using muscle power. So with what uh, is going to be called a loop, they're going to take sledgehammers first and start hammering this iron. Try to get out any more impurities that are still in there. Try to reshape it and get sort of the structure to be stronger. And it's important to remember these iron workers, they don't know the chemistry of what they're doing. They know how to do it, but the actual sort of chemistry behind it is not as clear. So what they're doing is from years of sort of work and experience, it's relying on their senses. You know, they're looking at the glow of the iron. What color is it? They're smelling. Are there any impurities that they're still smelling in there that might be coming out? Things like sulfur, you could smell. They're feeling what's the bounce of that um, sledgehammer when I hit it. All of those are going to impact the work they're doing. And I said that years of experience. Eventually, they're going to form this into about a brick that your sledgehammers, you're not going to be able to do much more work with. So they're going to move over to the 500-pound trip hammer. So this is a water-powered hammer that gets lifted up on sort of an arm, and then the can moves out of the way, and it slams back down again. Over and over, this hammer is slamming. And all the while, workers are holding them with basically glorified tongs turning and maneuvering this hot iron as it's being worked by this hammer, eventually turning it into a standardized sort of bar of metal called, that we'd call a, uh, a merchant bar. Um, so again, this is an incredible toll on the workers' bodies and on their minds. And what's truly incredible about this enterprise is they decide we're going all out. We're building everything we need to make this sort of ironworks work. And one thing they decide to build is called a rolling and slitting mill. It is state-of-the-art technology in the 1600s. It's a way to rework that wrought iron into other shapes that'll be usable for blacksmiths. So they can reheat that iron. They're not melting it. They're heating it up so it's pliable. And then they're going to pass it actually through rollers. First, a series of rollers to sort of compress it. So you can think of like making like long lasagna noodles in a pasta maker. Um, that would create flats that could be used to wrap around wagon wheels, or you can cut out teeth for saw blades. Or they're going to also pass it through what's called slitters that are going to turn it into uniform, skinny bars of iron called nail rod. Pretty easy to guess what they're making with that. Um, so using these different pieces, this is going to be um, some of the products that they're creating, these semi-finished products that they can then sell to blacksmiths. You know, they're not creating the nails here. They're not creating the saw blades, but they're creating the iron that then can be sold around the colony and to other places too, to then be transformed to what the community needs. And a lot of information that we have about this building, the rolling and slitting mill, was inspired by this weird looking sort of what we call the squid on the bottom right corner. This is actually a mistake from the rolling and slitting mill. You can see it's a piece of metal that was being passed through the slitters and it got caught there. Maybe it cooled off too quickly. You can imagine an iron worker just being frustrated, you know, ripping it out of the machine, trying to get it out just tossing it in the back of the building because they don't want to see it anymore. Well, you know, in 1950, this was a gold mine of information because it tells them, yes, there was a rolling and slitting mill. This is the type of shape they were making with it. These are the dimensions. All of this information from one artifact there. And 
a lot of this work is being done by, by water wheels. We'll talk about Joseph Jenks in a moment, but he's also relying on the water power that's being harnessed here. So historically, there were 11 water wheels on site. Today, the National Park still has seven, and we can run some of them during um, tours of the site, which is always a hit. Like I said, a lot of what this ironworks is creating is sort of that semi-finished iron that then can be sold to blacksmiths. So you can imagine that blacksmiths all around the colony are going to buy merchant bars, are going to buy nail rod and flax to create what is in demand in their community. One person that's going to know the sort of blacksmithing trade and the ironworking trade very well, as we spoke about, is going to be Joseph Jenks. So Joseph Jenks Sr. Um, is coming over to the ironworks. And he sets up a really interesting sort of relationship with the ironworks. Throughout his time in Saugus, he is part independent contractor, part ironworks employee, part ironworks investor. His role shifts kind of throughout that time that the ironworks is open, but he'll be, he's, you know, on site really throughout it. Um, and he sets up a shop that both supports the ironworks and also serves as a shop for himself. So he's also selling things to other people, not just working specifically for the ironworks. In this shop, which you can see the archaeological archaeological evidence on the right, he's going to have three wheel pits. He's going to be making anything from saw blades, like that one in the center of the building, to sides and other sort of bladed materials. Like Allison mentioned, a lot of his background and his family's background is going to be coming from sword making. Um, but he's also going to experiment. He creates wire pulling machines where he can make wire pins or other sort of pulled metal for things like fish hooks. So he's a really incredible and interesting sort of personality. Roland Robbins, who I mentioned, that archeologist called him the most exciting pioneer in America's industrial history that I have ever met. He really was, you know, incredibly impressed by Jenks and throughout his career, even after he was done sort of working for the Ironworks Association, uh, Robbins wanted to make sure that Jenks' story was being told. He thought it was that valuable. Um, but because of Jenks' interesting relationship with the historic Ironworks, you know, both part of but also separate from the Ironworks, when the American iron and steel industry was rebuilding the reconstruction of Saugus Ironworks in the 1950s, they chose not to rebuild Joseph Jenks's shop, which is a real shame and obviously something that bothered Roland Robbins. Um, you know, it's such an interesting story, but the decision was made that at least at that time, they thought his story wasn't truly part of the Ironworks story, you know? Um, so we, uh, I love, you know, talking about him. We have many people that like to learn about Jenks. Um, so it, it's always good to try to share the story, even if there's not a reconstruction of his workshop. Allison brought up, you know, right from the get go, this idea of networks, right? And there's a few that are really going to be at play at Saugus. A big one is going to be those skilled iron workers. So everyone from Lit Richard Leader, Joseph Jenks, the many other iron workers that are going to be recruited from England they're going to face this sort of unique challenge. Like Allison sort of pointed out, they're in the community, but not necessarily of the community. They have special permissions to not attend church service because they need to keep things like the furnace going 24 seven. They're living in sort of their own community that's at that time, sort of on the outskirts of the early colony. But they're also, well paid. They're, you know, skilled, their works in demand, but that's going to come at odds with some of the Puritan morality and laws. So there are many examples of workers uh, similar to Joseph Jenks Jr.'s wife being fined for wearing great boots or wearing things that are above their station. 
Um, you know, there's concerns about how are they spending their time? Are they drinking too heavily? Are they, you know, are they bringing other ideas into the community or are they not, you know, representing this Puritan value? Um, so this underlying conflict is going to continue throughout the time the Ironworks is open. You add into that another group of outsiders with Scottish prisoners of war. So during the, um, during the English Civil War, there's going to be an incredible amount of Scottish prisoners of war captured, um, including at the Battle of Dunbar in 1650. And the idea in England is if we let them go, they're just going to come right back. They're going to form again. They're going to fight us again. So uh, prisoners of war were being sold as indentured servants. So they were sold to different bidders to work a term, usually seven years, um, in a different industry. And 35 of these POWs are actually going to be sold to the Ironworks uh, Corporation and brought over to Massachusetts. Some of them are then going to be sold to others in the community, uh, but a majority are going to stay on site and be used as labor, basically hard labor, for the ironworks. So these men are going to be doing a lot of the very unglamorous jobs, cutting trees, moving materials, you know, this hard backbreaking work throughout their seven years, you know. As much as the you know English skilled workers weren't part of the community, what would it have felt like to be one of these Scottish prisoners of war, to be removed from your family, from your homeland, not by your choice, and to try to make a new life in this colony? So many after the ironworks close aren't going to get an opportunity to travel back to Scotland or England. You know, they are going to stay, they're going to create their own communities around New England um, and create things like charitable organizations, um, one of which is still going today. So they have an impact on this local community. Now, I've said kind of from the beginning, the ironworks really only lasts from about 1646 to the early 1670s, which isn't very long for such a big um, industry, right? Like clearly they've invested a huge amount of money, manpower, effort to build this, and yet it doesn't last that long. There's kind of right from the get-go a lot of mismanagement and lawsuits and finger pointing. There's, you know, proof of one of the early managers, you know, skimming materials off the top and not giving those Irish prisoners of war, you know, the food that, you know, as much food as they should be. Uh, given, for example. So there's there's really mistreatment from the beginning, um, and there's lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. People try to keep things running, Joseph Jenks being one of them, you know, tries to find other investors or other ways to keep it going. But by the 1670s, it's just not happening. Um, so what does that mean for the people involved? You have sort of stories and records of um, in these lawsuits, a lot of people recognizing, you know, a lot the people that are suffering are the workers that aren't getting paid, the workers that aren't being treated fairly, that are going to sort of lose their job. And pretty quickly at the close of the ironworks, you're going to have skilled labor starting to move throughout these other colonies and try to spread this idea of ironworking, right? At this point, 1670s, this is not the only ironworks happening. There's other skilled workers with this knowledge. Um, but you have Joseph Jenks Jr. heading down to Pawtucket. You have the Leonard family that's going to be continuing to be involved in ironworking in Massachusetts and New Jersey. John Winthrop Jr., who tried to originally start up this ironworks, he's going to have another enterprise down in New Haven, Connecticut, which is going to pull some of these workers. So this sort of workforce is going to be traveling throughout and shaping and reshaping the landscape. So I want to, I'm going to change this picture because it's also my background picture, but I want to move on to this slide here and uh, pause for a minute. I know that was a lot of historical ironworking, so I'll uh, 
encourage Allison to join me and see if we have any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. And it gives us such great texture and detail. It's so true that we really can't understand the importance of the machine age, right? And this start of mass production without understanding that foundation, right? How did people mm -hmm. start to begin this type of production? And Kathy commented that she didn't consider that charcoal had to be made. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's truly incredible as you start to think about it and look at that. And I mean, we can see that in our day-to-day -day lives nowadays is where are those raw materials coming from and what does that look like? What's the hard work that goes unseen before you even get to start making an item? I think what's so... Yeah, great point. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, it was so great about our two stories is whether we're talking about something as simple as thread or, you know, another family that has a big connection to this that definitely advanced because of people like the Jinx, the Wilkinson family, right, which creates the screw cutting lathe to start to mass produce parts for machines. Um, I think part of what we are always thinking about is the way, oh, we have so many questions. It's great. Um, mm -hmm. Is the way that the building blocks of our everyday life are made in a way that's invisible to us and that that's new. That the idea that you wouldn't know how your clothing is held together by thread or yarn or where the sheep came from to produce the wool, that's a relatively modern phenomenon. Uh, someone did have a question for you, Andrew, about bog iron, if you could talk a bit more about that relative to Saugus. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so bog iron is going to form, like I said, in a lot of bogs and marshes. It's going to come from sort of decaying and collecting um, organic materials sometimes, so bacteria and other things like that, and over time form into um, this uh, this bog iron. So it is really an imperfect way to get iron. It has a lot of waste material that you're trying to remove from there, mm -hmm. um, but it is kind of what was available to these sort of colonists. So um, yeah, it's not it's not mining as much as more kind of uncovering really on the surface level of things like bogs, marshes, things like that. Hope that answers that question. And Tim had a question, which is you had brought up that you have this interaction, this documented interaction of indigenous peoples being hired to do particular tasks mm -hmm. for the ironworks. And Tim was wondering if you could talk more about what other things Indigenous peoples were producing along the river, perhaps before or alongside the ironworks. Yeah, great question. Thank you. And I think uh, something that's really important to recognize about that spot on the Saugus River is that's been a sort of meeting and a gathering spot for thousands of years. It is the last spot in the Saugus River that is uh, tidal. So mm -hmm. it is impacted by the tide. You uh, also see that as a spot where, especially historically, you'd have runs of fish depending on the season. Um, and around that area on the Saugus River is a large quantity of what's called uh, Saugus Jasper. It's mm -hmm. a stone. It's not technically a Jasper. It's technically a rhyolite, but that's okay. Don't ask me more than that because I don't know mm -hmm. my geology. Um, but that is a, a tool and a or that there's a stone that many Pawtucket and other indigenous groups uh, were using to create projectile points. Uh, mm -hmm. It was also a spot that you might make other stone tools, ax heads and hammers. Um, so we have an incredible thousands of indigenous artifacts showing that this was a meeting spot sort of year after year for the indigenous community. Um, and work like that was happening to create those types of stone tools, as well as many other, you know, there would have been creation of many other things, wovens and textiles and things like that, that have not survived in, you know, in the New England soil. I had another question, which is about artifacts, and particularly with mm -hmm. the Robbins excavations, do you either have a sense of how many total artifacts have been found, or how many does the park actually own? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it is it is in the thousands, if not tens of thousands. 
Um, you know, and it's all sorts of shapes and sizes. It's from small um, nails or chips of um, stone from making stone tools to entire, there's an entire hammerhead, a 500 pound metal hammerhead that was dug out of the, uh, dug out of the earth that you can see at the museum. Um, <laughs> so there's all, all sorts of scales of it. Um, and it's truly incredible because there's artifacts from the ironworks, but that is just one period in time. So there's lots of artifacts from before, from indigenous sort of communities, as well as artifacts from when it just became kind of a neighborhood. You know, if you come to Saugus Ironworks nowadays, you're in a suburban neighborhood. You blink and you miss it. Um, so you have, you know, little kids dolls from the early 1900s and other sort of community pieces like that. And Phyllis was wondering if you could talk a bit about where the other ironworks were located. Um, she's saying in Massachusetts and New Jersey, and I think there was maybe Connecticut through Winthrop as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not as familiar with those, unfortunately. Some of them in Massachusetts are going to be out more Western Mass, kind of Springfield area, places like that. Um, New Jersey, I don't know which group, which New Jersey sort of foundry the leaders were involved in, um, but there's there's a, a whole network, and that's a good question. You know, one site, when we talk about National Park connections, um, that we connect with thematically, but not through human networks is Hopewell Furnace down in Pennsylvania. You know, they're going to come from a little bit of a different school, obviously. Um, so we don't have direct connections of, oh, such and such a family founded Hopewell Furnace, but uh, it is another incredible story with the Park Service. And Kathy had another question, which was, you know, it seems like iron working was mostly for tools or utilitarian mm -hmm. in this time period. And I know that your park, if you want to give a plug for this, has done wonderful work on people who use this set of skills as artists. When mm -hmm. did this become, at least in this area, more of a way to do art or to produce art as opposed to a practical tool making field? Yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic question. And I mean, I think things like, you know, iron for iron fences, I think is like an example given, especially in the colonies is going to probably take a while because that's going to be such a, a status symbol because of the price of it. You know, it takes so much time and manpower. And especially in the 1600s, these mm -hmm. ironworks are obviously few and far between with, you know, Hammersmith being the first. So I don't know exactly when you're going to see that transition, but it has to come obviously with more and more access to cheaper iron, right? It can't be that you're using bog iron um, and this sort of slower process. Um, but an exact time, I'd, I'd be curious. I have to do some more research on that. When that type of transition happens, when it becomes more accessible. And do you have a good picture of the bellows? That is a great question. We do have lots of them. Do I have one easily accessible? I will check real quick but I'm happy to answer other questions too. And I think Shannon is asking a question that might bring us back to Hopewell Furnace, which is whether uh -huh. these, I, I sort of know the answer to this because we just yeah. talked about this. Does the ironworks get refired or reignited when cannon is being made for the Revolutionary War? Yeah, that's a, that is a great question. So this ironworks really doesn't. It's, it's very interesting how after the, Hammersmith kind of closes down it um it gets scavenged a bit you know some of the pieces are being sold off but other pieces like I said a 500 pound hammerhead just sits <laughs> on site until it's uncovered again um so this is not going to get relit it is incredible though the amount of iron working that starts to expand in the colonies you know, going from the 1640s, where there's no ironworks, you know, in sort of British North America, to by the 1760s uh, and 1770s, the British, uh, the American colonies are making a seventh of the world's iron. Wow. So, you know, 120, 130 years, and all of a sudden, they're keeping up with England, Germany, you know, these other, you know, more, much more industrialized um, kind of communities. 
it's it's really incredible. Um, and I do have at least one great picture of the bellows. I'm happy to screen share quickly. Yeah, of course. I'm sorry, I opened the wrong window. Here we go. Um, so this picture of the bellows is at the base of the blast furnace. Hopefully you can see that okay. Um, so yeah, these two bellows are at the bottom of the blast furnace. These are the largest bellows on site. And on the right hand side, you have that sort of long sort of uh, wooden shaft there. You might see these kind of half circles, little sort of cams. They're spaced in a way that uh, is basically uh, perpendicular to each other. Hmm. So as one bellow is being compressed, being pushed air out into the furnace, the other cam has cleared and it's reinflating. So back and forth and back and forth, these bellows are pumping throughout the uh, throughout the night. There are some smaller bellows, probably about half the size of those ones. There's three sets of those in the um, in the forge as well to light some of those smaller fires, so you can melt down that uh, that cast iron and reshape it. And if you need scale on this picture, I realize it's not great. There is, if you sneak <laughs> a look in the bottom left corner, there is a broom hiding back there that can maybe give you a little sense of scale <laughs> for these bellows. Yeah, hopefully that helps. Uh, that's also a great rationalization for it being <laughs> captured in the photo. <laughs> there we go, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll say we plan to have that. Part of you know why we love connecting with people who work at different national parks is each year we try to find six places that will challenge us to think a little bit differently about the Blackstone Valley and different larger stories that we have. And I think what's kind of fascinating is in both places, the Jenks maybe don't quite get their due, but are so mm -hmm. clearly you know a big part of this story. And I'll say too, what really inspired this particular focus on people and networks is we're always trying to show the labor that goes into the one great big breakthrough, right? All of the people who make that patent actually meaningful, mm -hmm. the people who actually have to do the work so that the privilege is making at least some number of people very wealthy, I think is super fascinating. We are hoping to bring you Parked at Home again in 2025. So that will be our fourth year of the series. And if you have suggestions for places that you would love for us to connect with, please feel free to reach out. And if you want to visit Andrew and his colleagues at the Saugus Ironworks, we at the Blackstone can confirm it is a 10 out of 10 visit. They give a very wonderful tour and you get to really see in action some of that foundational work that makes the later industry story possible. So thank you all for coming. It's so gratifying when you tell us that you enjoy learning about our parks. And we hope that if you are not parked at home this summer, you become parked at Saugus or Blackstone. We we won't be offended if you choose one over the other. We just want to see you somewhere. So thank you and special thanks to Sherilyn, who was our co-presenter this evening for doing a fantastic job. The like I've learned even more with you with us here tonight. So thank you all so much. And usually our presenters, if you have any other quick questions, you can feel free to ask Andrew. He got grilled on all things Bog tonight <laughs> um, and did a wonderful job, of course. So thank you all so much for coming.